Hello, both electrons people. Thank you so much for having us. Cara Stacy, Dr. Cara Stacy, you definitely recognize for, from some previous um, sessions that you've had. I'm a new fresh face, but a very old face to Cara as we've been <laughs> friends for many years and we studied together at the University of Cape Town at the South African College of Music. Um, that's where we began a whole musical relationship which is in part related to what we're talking about today which is companionship in composition, alternative roots and using what's there. So yes. Thanks for the intro Gazi. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think we, our talk, our concert is happening after this talk. Um, so, but it's probably worth just mentioning that we have two pieces, um, we've included in our portion of the concert, two pieces that come from a project that we completed earlier this year called Like the Grass Atelier. Um, the first, um, the first kind of coordinated by Galina and the second coordinated by myself, but that's a larger quartet project. Uh, funded by Pro Helvetia, um, which we did in the first half of this year with a German harp player, Antonio Ravens, and a Swiss feedback guitarist person, uh, improviser, Beat Keller. Um, and so those those are two quite important and big pieces of work that we've done this year, and we decided we wanted to put that forward for both electrons. And then the final part of our uh, presentation is a new work that we worked on together. Um, and I guess for this talk, we wanted to um, <laughs> doggy doggy footprints in the background. Um, for, <laughs> for this for this talk, we thought we would. There are a couple of themes that we want to uh, discuss uh, that that resonate in both of our different uh, and separate and co collaborative work uh, together. Uh, and that are, I think, kind of important and interesting things that we kind of grapple with in our work also independently, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So to speak a bit about um, the first two pieces, so the ones as part of the Like the Grass Atelier, Contrast, uh, it, well, Contrast is the second one, the first one is Process. Um, maybe we could discuss some of the processes that we had in making that. So. The whole idea with that piece is it came from a live recording that we did. So we had a concert in Basel, which was this very special magical night with lots of cheese and wine. And, you know, there was a very wonderful feeling in the room and it was a really beautiful live performance that was part of Cara's um, residency in Basel as part of Pro Helvetia. And it's very unusual that one actually kind of, well, I speak for myself, but I come away from a live recording that I'm actually happy with, where I'm thinking, yeah, that actually sounded good. There was just something in the room that night. Um, and when we decided to release it uh, with with Kit Records, we thought, well, we could just put it as a as a standalone kind of free composition, um, which, which is what it was. It was essentially a 45 minutes um, concert that was just from start to finish, you know, based on these graphic scores that that Cara had made, which um, she could speak a, a little bit about just now. Um, but kind of free flowing, going through all these many different feelings and textures and moments. And we thought, okay, well, I guess the classical approach to that, the so-called classical pr approach would be to say, okay, well, this is the entirety of the concert and let's just present it as is, and this is the work. But I think at the time, both of us were thinking a lot about the relationship between classical music and also remixed music, electronic music, more kind of contemporary music. And how would we take those really wonderful, unpredictable, exciting, strange, irreparable sounds? Because essentially, you know, that's the thing about free improv. You can only do it once. It happens in a moment and it's never to be repeated. You could say that about all sorts of performances, but to an extreme degree, free improvisation. You just never know what's coming. You never know uh, where it's going to end. Um, how do we put that in some kind of conversation um, with electronic music, groove based music? Even I go for so far as to say, because that's something that I was listening to so much of at the time. Um, how do you take something that might be perceived as really inaccessible and put it in a context which is, seems extremely much more accessible? Um, and I'd go, so we decided to actually take that music and remix it. So both Cara and myself did two remixes and then we got some producers that we love very much 
um, to to actually have a go at, at putting it into a completely different context. And we thought, okay, we'll have a side as the live performance, which we also had a very um, unclassical approach to in that we edited it down and we we kind of maybe chopped bits that we liked and we put them together and then had a free flowing first section. And then our B, our B side of the record was all remixes. Um, so yeah, Kari, you could tell us a bit about the graphic scores of that. Yeah, I think I it may have come up in an earlier boat electrons. I can't remember now, but but essentially it was you know during my time in 2018 in Basel, I spent quite a bit of time thinking firstly about the natural environment and sound, and then also graphic scores, which I hadn't really explored much before. Um, <clears throat> and so yeah, so we played. I created this uh, graphic score that was related to different natural uh, uh, companions I had during my time in Switzerland. So birds in the park nearby, rivers, I was thinking a lot about rivers, so and I grew up next to a river uh, in Swaziland, Eswat the kingdom of Eswatini, soon to maybe not be a kingdom anymore. Um, and so, so yeah, that was kind of the inspiration. It was kind of more of a kind, it was a graphic score, it, there were certain instructions to do with each movement, and each movement dealt with a kind of a uh, different visual stimulus, but then also a different kind of natural or kind of environmental theme. Um, so, so that kind of guided some of the free improv. Um, yeah, it was a structured improv in that way. Uh, the thing for me that was really special about that project, though, is that the two different, that the one side was kind of, in theory, instant. And and the other side was had a very long marinating period for all of the producers who were kind of reimagining those sounds, um, and I think that yeah I just I've 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 quite often thought about free improv and maybe you know music that's a little bit less accessible, a little bit more challenging to listen to kind of in a mainstream sense. How to how do we bridge? music that's really interesting and fun to play and really interactive and requires a lot of musicianship, uh, you know, in in the moment with stuff that people are listening to, you know, to dance or, you know, for their for very obvious and easy enjoyment. Um, and I think that's I think we kind of well, I, it was an interesting experiment in seeing how we could essentially have the same musical nuts and bolts, but just have totally different approaches and timescales, you know, in terms of, of, of generating or kind of or, arranging and creating an arc or composing with those those building blocks mm. um, and then the idea so 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 we released that as a vinyl record as Galina was saying um oh we should mention which instruments we were playing so for that i had a i was playing a violin mainly and i had an effects pedal a loop station which um it's, it's quite a traditional and kind of boring piece of equipment one can think the the rc50 of roland but it's been uh, it served me as a really great companion for all these all these years just obviously not just the layering capacities but the fact that you can time stretch with tempos right after you've recorded something you can reverse things and it's that kind of way that it also picks up a lot of sound especially on on, on the microphone i'm using the dpa clip on because it's not a clean feed you get all this other kind of resonances in the room and sniffles and <laughs> coughs, which I think there were quite a few of them in the performance. And that all ends up going into this kind of washing machine of unpredictability. And and I just find that as an instrument, especially as a single line instrument, it just gives me so much back that I can work with that um, that has been, yes, a very trusty companion, though I'm definitely need to expand some tech directions because I'm getting a bit tired of it now. But yeah, so that was me on the violin and um, Cara, was playing no, I had a mix of different things I was playing it's it's kind of my usual setup at this point in time which is not no piano although there's more piano in my life now um but uh budongo which is this Ugandan lamellophone quite a big body lamellophone uh a mouthbow umkube the South African mouthbow uh from the Eastern Cape um I had this mchingo uh overtone flute uh, and a Nyunga Nyunga, so in a, a Mozambican um, or Zimbabwean, also Lamellophone and Bira variant. Uh, I think those were the four instruments, and I sang a little bit as well. So we so we had that, and then Antonia on harp and voice, and Beat on his specially made Norwegian 
um, feedback guitar. So essentially, we had a mix of kind of electronic sounds through through Guzzi's effects. That's oh, Guzzi being me. Sorry, just for the listeners. Sorry, Helena. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and then quite dry acoustic sounds coming from myself and Antonia mostly. So that was kind of the combination of things. But I think, as Galina pointed out, you know, she had a huge, there's a huge range that comes from her setup. There's a huge, even though it's essentially two instruments, violin and, and loop station. Uh, from my side, I have numerous instruments. So lots of lots of options, but, but some of them like the overtone flute, um, you know, it, it just has one, it's the overtone series of one fundamental. So it's not like, it doesn't have a huge amount of uh, harmonic or melodic range um, in that way. So, so a few different tools, but each of them a little bit more limited in terms of not necessarily timbrely, but but in terms of like melody and harmony, not a huge amount of variation I can bring mm. um, from that. And so I'd say something about that concert that was also um, an element in the room was the kind of cross-continental meeting. So mm -hmm. there's Cara and myself who are extremely good friends. We've known each other for a long time. We're from the same place. We speak the same kind of cultural language. And these um, musicians from Germany and Switzerland, respectively, who didn't know each other at all and who we had just very recently met. So that was also a very interesting dynamic being thrown into the pot. It's like how we get these things to speak to each other, kind of interesting instruments to be in combination with each other, just this flute and kind of feedback guitar and all these Southern African instruments and violin and, you know, how, how to make that work, but also how to I think we we notice kind of differences in our approaches to what musically feels right to us. So I think, for example, Beat um, is very much from a, a noise guitar world, from a, a kind of a, a very experimental sound world, where you know, though he is, I, I think, jazz trained um, initially, his 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 sound world can get quite. Um, got quite quite dark quite heavy quite expansive car and i can often find ourselves leaning more towards kind of melodic patterns and 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 loops and interwoven things that that work together so it's the kind of tension of these these different sound worlds and maybe some people wanting things to be slightly more accessible and some people wanting to kind of tear them apart and make them messier and more aggressive and you know so we were already at that stage thinking about all these different tensions um and all these different chance meetings because i think um the way it came about that i was in the same place and they were in the same place it was just there were so many kind of serendipitous things about that and we thought well you know this thing of chance elements coming together all these these different things that we're, we're grappling with it felt like the project kind of didn't end after after that album was released it was like the, these conversations and these resonances and tensions they continue and, and and it just felt completely natural to continue with that material and then continue with that collaboration and see what the ne what the next place it was taking us to so that led on to the, the the two pieces that you're you're going to hear in the concert yeah exactly so we actually um, a lot of this is thanks to Pearl Vetsi I'll just give them a little shout out not to sound like a corporate podcast but at the same time because they really do have done have been super generous uh, in terms of my work and just really you know do so much for music here but but um you know there was an opportunity to apply for funding to um continue the project essentially and that that brings us to what happened this year essentially it was planned in 2019 you know just before the album came out on vinyl so it was kind of like a, it was meant to be an in-person tour in southern africa um uh kind of to launch the record or soon after the record came out um and then obviously that got coveted so we we, we budgeted a couple of times and then in the end settled on a kind of online atelier format um where we would create new works uh like many people were doing during this time create new essentially ele electroacoustic works with visuals accompanying visuals um, and then the idea was that essentially it would be some kind of online tour anyway, because at that time Cape Town, uh, Galena was in Cape Town, I was in Johannesburg, uh, Beat was in Winterthur, and uh, uh, Antonia was in Basel. She's German, but she lives in Basel. So, so, so 
And, but we had some interesting conversations about how we would make these works. Also time had passed. And I can definitely say for myself, my, my in, intensive interest in one way of making music definitely shifts over time. So it was really interesting to kind of reconnect again, all three quite diverse players who have very different training and backgrounds to or all four of us, sorry, to all come together um, and find that things had kind of shifted again. And we were, we were having maybe even yeah slightly different conversations about what what was good and what wasn't good and what worked aesthetically and what didn't. Mm. So essentially we created four new works. Each work was kind of headed by one person, but had a collaborative aspect. And in my head, as I was thinking of it, planning it beforehand, I thought it would be really nice to test out considering we are all improvisers and some of us are composers as well. I guess we're all composers in different ways, maybe Antonia less so. Uh, but the idea was that we would we would play around with different ways of composing, you know, kind of unpack that term a little bit with each different new work. Um, so the the two that you hear in the concert are obviously, as I said before, Galena's the first one and mine the second. Um, the third piece, uh, Beat was very busy and going on tour, so we did an online improv, totally free improv, which. Uh, as I think I said in the program notes, it kind of made sense because that was how we started our initial creative kind of collaboration between the four of us. Uh, and then Antonia had her own way of creating music as well. So we had different instructions for the quartet and then we'd assemble the recordings or whatever it was, uh, and then each create our own piece um, with obviously lots of, you know, sharing it with people and getting feedback and, and that kind of thing. And the new element that was happening this time was that we were adding video. So I, at, at the time I was studying my masters at Goldsmiths and I'd been doing some audio visual composition modules and getting into documentary filmmaking and artist film. So, you know, the idea was that we had stumbled upon this new art form of video that was, you know, was still quite new to us all. Um, and we wanted, to put that into the conversation too, which obviously wasn't at all part of the conversation with, you know, just the live performance and the, the album release. And I think when you start thinking visually about music and you think about the kind of narrative of, of, of the visual story that you're telling and the, the imagery and the way those things meld together, it just adds a whole other layer of complexity. So um, to speak about the, the first video process, that was very much all about the things that I've been discussing now about um, especially in free improv that feeling of kind of searching for things um, and not having preordained things so the process of making the process of kind of colliding with people the process of selecting and editing and taking out little bits I wanted the whole piece to feel quite um, fidgety quite in process quite unfinished quite um, textured. So I also took little videos from rehearsals that we had, little conversations, little bits of voices in the background, this idea of cells multiplying, um, this idea that some of it was in rehearsal, some of it was performed, that some of it was kind of in the same room, that some of it was over different mediums. Just all of those things that kind of, that your mind muddles through when you're trying to turn something just from an idea into something that you're ready to kind of present to people and what happens in that that space between those two things. Um, that's kind of where my head was at. And the, the whole thing is also, we, we're challenging that idea of a single author because all of us have really contributed different parts. Um, and it was more of a kind of a cure, curation in a way the video was kind of okay this is my lens on what we've been doing but I'm still taking bits of your your thing here and your thing there and I'm trying to tell I'm trying to tell my story with it but we're all collectively involved in that story which is yeah it kind of challenges the idea of the author composer who has a very fixed idea of you do this you do this yes it's like what's already there um what happened how did I interpret it um so yeah that's another dynamic that's something that we've definitely spoken out about a lot and maybe Cara can tell us about the piece her piece contrast yeah so so the thing I liked about the whole project is that everyone had really different approaches uh to the work and lots of different themes kind of emerged so um for me I guess I was kind of thinking about the different elements 
that you can kind of bring together in, in making a piece of music interesting or a piece of sound or whatever. So, so, and I was thinking about contrast because I obviously live in Johannesburg and living in South Africa, contrast is like the kind of foundation of our society. <laughs> um, and it's obviously, it's very glaring here in Johannesburg. And I was, then I was, so I was kind of rooting it in a place, in a city, uh, there are aspects of Cape Town in the video as well. So it's kind of, it's more broadly about South Africa, but at the same time, or drawn, inspired by South Africa, but at the same time thinking about the different ways, um, yeah, just how we can use contrast as an organizing structure in, or element uh, in, in composition of one kind or another. So essentially what I did, I did a mix of different things. I, I, I read a Alan Payton quote about Johannesburg, which I will misquote now, but it was something like, there's only there, there, there's only one, there need only be one, something like that. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's only one Johannesburg and that's fine. Um, <laughs> so, so I had that kind of in mind. Anyway, I, I, I was thinking about that initially and then I sent a, a series of kind of Pauline Oliveras type instructions to everybody about, you know, thinking of different themes or kind of words or you know what certain words would make you think and how you interpret that on your instrument and record that just a couple of seconds of that and then send it all back to me and then assembled this piece so it was a little bit more composed in that way and i was a little bit more like the, the it was less collaborative in that way uh but i anyway the point was was i was thinking a lot about contrast and i think uh, even within the the way the sections of the piece kind of interact and sound, there's a there's a good amount of contrast in that. Um, but also, I was thinking we were having conversations uh, about what we liked and what we didn't like as four independent thinkers and makers of things, and it was that push and pull between things being not even accessible, things being have you know having a particular preference in terms of what something sounds like or, or doesn't sound like um you know something being pleasing and then other things kind of ideologically needing to be uh, completely not that against that that shouldn't be a, a, a kind of consideration in when you organize sound and, and create music so we, we had tensions we had some interesting kind of aesthetic conversations between the group again slightly more advanced over a little bit you know a, little, a few years later uh kind of similar similar conversations about that uh that and i had that contrast that idea of those contrasting ideas as well kind of coming through um so there, there are two additional videos you can see them up on youtube um that come from the project um and have also totally different like organizing structures and compositional kind of methods behind them but i think for me so this was a big project we, we spent quite a, you know it's been numerous years now working as this kind of quartet but Gillian and I've been working together for a really long time uh, from playing in bands together and doing kind of singing songs together and playing all sorts of instruments that we did not know how to play at the time you know chopping and changing instruments and well through so many different creative things yeah <laughs> um so so I think there yeah I think something for me that's kind of come up again and again especially because I didn't have I had a, a little bit of a formal compositional training but but then essentially I was kind of kicked into my musical life where I basically had to compose quite a bit in lots of different scenarios and also across lots of different kind of stylistic barriers um and I was always just wondering what this term means and and how people use it and, and all the kind of values that are associated with it composition less less so with improvisation but composition especially has this particularly complicated and kind of elitist in some contexts and in other like really uplifting and kind of important uh other kinds of meanings that's associated with it in other contexts i think now about like you know talking about different indigenous instrument players as composers um so so yeah i think there are a couple of other there's some theoretical issues and ideological issues that galena and i've been talking about for many years now about how we actually make music mm -hmm. Uh, considering we both had quite alternative paths to kind of coming to this place of creating music, whether it was scored or, or not scored or composed or more improvised, a bit more open and fluid. Mm. Um, so a vulnerable aspect f for me in that in that first piece, for example, is that I included a bit where 
we were just it was it was that part even before a jam before you've even started improvising with someone where you're just kind of practicing and trying things out and i thought you know what would be like if i expose that for what it is and just kind of allow people into that window of imperfection you know where there's some out of tune notes and, you, and you're, you're still searching for something and you haven't quite found it and what is the the value the artistic value what is the the kind of feeling of, of vulnerability that you get by hearing that that space um which is usually kept very private you know usually mm -hmm. it's just that polish thing which is exposed to other people and you know that's also in terms of composition that line between trying things out and that line between deciding you know well this is it we've th this is right you know this is the correct thing this is the thing that we want to let out into the wild um mm -hmm. and everything in between that and that's always been quite interesting to the both of us and in terms of you know the title companionship in composition i think you know for us there's always been a personal trajectory to all these ideas which is you know in tandem with our growth growing up you know going through different stages of of music stumbling on different things so maybe transitioning from thinking of ourselves as purely just classical musicians to something else or you producers improvisers composers maybe not musicians at all sometimes how does that feel how, how does it feel to create things when you've let go of that idea of yourself as a particular kind of musician and so much of that has been informed i think by um just conversations about life in general and um the way these terms feel and and whether they still fit anymore and whether they've shifted and though that kind of continual conversation that you have is, is an incredible artistic resource i think we've realized um that that you can continue relationships where these changing things just become part of the musical conversation totally and i i think also you've touched on another important issue which is just personal relationships you know i think there's a huge amount i think i feel now like with the like the grass project you know we we have good relationships with with the other two people in the quartet um and and that that's you know there's a particular kind of energy between all of us that meant that 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 night in particular in Basel went so well and it was also probably a bit of the French delicious French cheese and wine that we <laughs> consumed but but um you know we also as I think we've I've definitely spoken about before uh you know we played in the shot ensemble with Matthijs van Dijk, Sarah Evans, Nicola Dutoy, Lumiswa, there are lots of people who've been involved in the ensemble. And I think that 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 element of like personal relationships and friendships that kind of allow for a certain safe space, all the safe space is not, maybe that's not the right term, but, but you know, the, there's an openness to trying things out. And also, um, I think, you know, a lot of the people that we work with, collaborate with regularly and, and, and have for a really long time are also people who, who don't necessarily subscribe to these really classical or traditional, and I say classical, not in the musical sense, like quite traditional roles of composer, you need to have, you know, you need to have gone a certain path in order to be called that or to do that kind of work. Uh, you know, performer, you need to have done this in this, you know, it's it's a much more fluid kind of experimental space. Where we're like, oh, we're trying that now. Or, and I've definitely been inspired by most of the people that I've worked with, I've been lucky to work with so many musicians, including Galina and Matthijs and all, you know, all of everyone around me, you know, people to be so fluid and skilled, uh, you know, to be able to play something that's much more, to have a sense of more groove based stuff that, you know, and be able to kind of musically interpret that or kind of bounce onto it quite quickly and then move into another space where, you know, there's so many different musical references that I think sometimes these these conversations that that kind of rely on 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 an understanding of genre or kind of a more conventional or, or conservative um understanding of, of of genre a lot of the musicians that we work with often are kind of i don't know not not engaging with that in the same way or, or kind of disregarding it and 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 just thinking about music making and in a, in a less elitist way in a more open kind of way I think mm. and that's been really inspiring for me because it, it pushes you also to be a better all rounder, I think. Mm. And it, it, it kind of relates to 
some of the themes that came up in conversations when we had our composers talks as part of the like the grass atelier program that Cara mentioned we spoke with uh, we spoke with Lucas Huber and Naomi Younga and I think something that came up in their compositional practice was was similar that that human relationship is such an important element of it um I lost my train of thought <laughs> just... totally but I think both of them in different ways Lucas Huber we I I was not familiar with his work Antonia suggested him as the idea was that we would have two well we would have two different kind of collaborative conversations between the quartet and an interesting composer one person from South Africa and one person from Switzerland so obviously we wanted to ask Naomi Younger, who we've both worked with and you know is very inspiring and does lots of interesting work and then uh, Antonia suggested Lucas Huber, who I went and checked out in order to talk to him and super interesting, lots of theatre work and lots of, um, I guess they're both really different from each other, but similarly um, unconventional approaches to, to, to working with other people and composing. Yes, and yeah, that's that that's what that's what I was um, trying to say earlier is that that musical practice for them is just an extension of living so it's not. In my professional life, I'm a composer and, uh, you know, I'm the grand auteur who scores the masterpieces and then I go into my personal life and I leave that at the door, though I'm sure lots of composers wouldn't say that anyway, but that music is actually a way of understanding the world around you, not only a way of understanding and relating to the world around you, but, you know, a lens through which to deepen your relationships um a way to understand yourself and your world better rather than something that you kind of dictate it's it's something that gives back to you and it and it's completely inseparable from your relationships and and your your feelings about life and i think i love i love that idea i love the idea the the kind of implication that there's a space for vulnerability mm. in music making that comes from that and other stuff that we've spoken about now and anyways things we talk about all the time because I think there's you know I see it around me in lots of different other musical spaces uh, especially in the jazz world like there's a vulnerability always whether people are able to articulate it or be honest about it or not you know sometimes it's a really macho kind of ensemble where everyone like you know this is the music this is how it's supposed to be no one messes it up that in itself is so <laughs> so extremely obviously fragile <laughs> you know um in another way and i think there's you know it, i i think maybe it's just the training that we had um i don't know it took me quite a bit of time to find that space for the personal and the vulnerable and the you know creatively and personally so that you can feel you can be creative and open and try things and take risks and things don't work out or they do or you know or you try something and it just doesn't come together uh you know so so yeah i think that that kind of that kind of space to breathe and and operate personally and musically i think is so important and i think both of those composers seem to like create that space or make that space for performers or, or for themselves and for performers as well absolutely yeah yeah i think i mean we've covered a lot of the stuff that i think we both feel is important okay stuff to do with the project uh, but then also just I think there are a lot of questions for me about composition that still sit there. Um, I've recently gone back and started having lessons in like scored classical composition again, kind of just out of interest, also just a kicking kicking my butt into gear in terms of that. I'm making music all the time in other ways, but but just going back and because I never had that formal training, just you know, learning a bit of that kind of craft. What worries me, it's been amazing, it's completely incredible. Um, what worries me though is that, um, I don't know, things to do with classical composition in that more traditional way in which we understand it. You know, there's also an, a kind of colonial aspect to it. There's a kind of hierarchy, there's an implied like um, superiority, even just in terms of how those, how things, um, are the kind of methods that you use mm -hmm. that I think if I was that kind of composer, I would be really worried that I would, that would be my world, that would be my frame for so much music making. Whereas I think we can both say that our careers have been filled with so many diverse um, opportunities and collaborations and things that really open your eyes to hearing and making music and 
and, and, and conceptualizing and composing things, not only just kind of in a free improv sense or in a jolly jamming sense, you know, like being able to actually have a musical idea and it be relatively static and spend time and, and craft in kind of creating it, but just not in that more conventional sitting at the piano with a, you know, <laughs> with your pencil and the candle and whatever and it, it's funny because recently i i was looking at the the prs um kind of funds where well, they, they have a composers um scholarships that they give out or prizes that they give out and even just within those categories you you really feel that distinction there's a tightness about the genres where it says this is for composers and if you don't if you're not a composer, then you must enter the hit makers category. <laughs> so I thought you're either a composer or a hit maker. So yeah. there's a few interesting implications there. One, that if you're composing that it's not really gonna be a hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, also that, that if you're a hit maker, whatever else you're making, that it's gonna you be didn't a actually hit. compose it. Yeah. If you, no, you but also that it's kind like of a beat maker. Said. Yeah, it implies some success, which you may not live up to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Actually, it's it's kind of <laughs> ambitious. Or at least the composers are allowed to make things that aren't hits. And yeah, yeah and totally. France for them. But you know, that struck me that um, what you know, we're I think really interested in is is all those spaces in between, um, a space for vagueness, a space for you know genuine radical creativity where you're not. As much of a cliche as it sounds that you're not bound by an idea of a genre and i think um as much as people claim not to be i think that's still in the back of their head that they they will find something slightly strange choice if you bring in an element that is perceived to be from you know a different kind of quarter even now um one would think that people were slightly more open in their ideas of that conversation with different types of music and I just want there always to be a space for genuine experimentation, which means mm -hmm. not being as experimental as you want within a free improv Germanic context where you could be, yeah. you know, playing the darkest, most atonal dissonant sounds and not expect anyone who ever listens to beats to ever be able to relate to it because that's not freedom. It's, it's to be able to always be in conversation with all of those other cultural influences with the politics of the time with the different instruments available to you the different technologies available to you the different kind of media platforms um and that's what i hope that we'll continue to do whether we're making hits or not i guess <laughs> totally i think that yeah i think i completely agree and i think um I think when you think of the kind of educational possibility, if I think about young people not feeling like there is this immense kind of ladder of skill that not to say that there isn't skill obviously involved in assembling any kind of music, conceptualizing it and creating it and producing it, whichever way it's going to go, however you're going to do it, but, but, but that openness that, that you could any kind of, whether it was a modular synth, which I find super intimidating, or writing for a string quartet, also super intimidating, that you could, that there isn't necessarily, even from a young age, you are encouraged not only to play instruments and make music in that way, you know, replicate other people's musics or learn other repertoire or whatever, but also be able to think that you could, just like you put paint on a piece of paper at a young age in the, whichever way you want, that you could do the same thing with sound and sometimes more complex sound as well, that you could do that. Um, and that what's important is your ideas and the sounds you're thinking of and how you want them to be assembled. You know, I think there are lots, there's so, still so much ground to be covered in terms of cre not only allowing for musicians like us in our ripe old age to feel that freedom and enjoy it, but also for young people to come up thinking that music is, it isn't just a series of closed doors or, you know, a Mount Everest to climb, but it's like, you know, there's freedom even in those learning stages. I think, I don't know what that really, what that looks like, but I think that's something that really interests me and the challenge of that interests me still. Maybe they're already doing it on TikTok and we just don't know because we haven't joined the platform. Could yet. be, could no, be. That's, that's the final frontier really, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, 
Cool. I think that's, that's everything that I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think a lot of these things are, not, are a bit unanswerable. So, or at least they, that's how they feel for me. But I think we've covered a lot of the things that are important to us um, in our and we friend. really And we really hope you enjoy the, the music and the videos that we've created. We didn't speak that much about the third piece, but yes, um, it's all there in the program notes. Um, and yes, it, enjoy it. Enjoy. And thanks to both Electrons for also having us on and uh, also just always uh, programming really interesting, diverse music makers. Cara and Delina, thank you so much. This is turning into <laughs> quite a Sunday afternoon. Fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Um, First of all, a word of apology to everybody that we're running slightly late, but we, we cannot let you go with, with, without um, checking out the chat line and the, uh, the questions. So once again, I am, yeah, completely um, hit free. I, I'm completely taken. Um, there's a question, <clears throat> if I may quickly dash through it. I love the discussion about composers versus hit makers. <laughs> and then uh, the... Um, the person continues, the discussion of vulnerability is also really valuable. Can you discuss the point about notation hierarchy and uncomfortable frames a little more? Have you found ways to work with this? Do you think there are any useful links between structured improv and notation, for instance? Mm. Um. How, just my experience, I mean, I, I really just dipped in, as I often do, uh, to graphic notation. <laughs> I dipped in and I did it a bit and then I got a bit bored and I moved on to something else. So I'm definitely not the right person to to um, answer that in a kind of more substantive way. But I think um, it was really interesting for me, having done quite a bit of improvising, free improv before that time, to think about all the different ways in which a piece could be articulated in which your instructions or any kind of visual it was a, it was a really creative experience and it led to lots of different performances of that work not only um with uh, this quartet but with with other people um so super interesting and it brought up quite a lot of interesting questions for me about what is the point of a work what truly are your ideas how much freedom can you give to different players if you are like is, was it an excuse for me just to do some drawings and think about music in that way? Because essentially, I didn't have any particular sonic um, best, Well, I, the work just was completely fluid and, and existed in lots of different forms. So, so, but I think there's there are a lot of issues to do with notation and 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 also working in lots of different spaces. Galina will have lots to say about this as well. Um, you know falling back on staff notation when it's useful and and then not using it in other contexts and how how it can be quite a hindrance in other spaces because of what it represents you know depending on who you're collaborating with or who the other musicians are and what their background is um i think i've i'm now at a point where i rely on it in a very garbled shorthand kind of way in lots of spaces where i'm generally memorizing things and it's not you know but but in theory, I wish I could just put it aside and just do use a totally different system or use lots of different systems. Mm -hmm. I'd say well, in terms of the vulnerability question and <clears throat> and form, um, I don't think I've ever found a, a a perfect form within musical language to be able to trust uh, that I feel safe in the outcome. I think that's a very kind of personal response to it but I think it's so much more about knowing that you're on the same page with the people that you're working with and that you your philosophy your philosophy of music and why you're in that joint experience together and what you kind of foresee it at the other side of it um, is aligned and I think finding that alignment in terms of your personal relationship um, is a, a much greater kind of surety <laughs> than any kind of particular methodology or form could be but that's just completely my my personal um view yeah. and yet two very uh, i find it very interesting that you work you collaborate very closely but i i sense that there is a slight different take on ideas um <clears throat> concerning hierarchy and, and notation perhaps the person who put the question could follow up 
uh, whilst I move on to the next, which is in the general chat. Um, the next question is from, from William Furry. <clears throat> so glad that your talk followed our discussion because there are so many points of conversions, <laughs> improv, etc., etc. I want to ask something else. We speak a lot about really great collaborations, but what happens to the less great collaborations? What do you take from them? Do they feed into your thinking around collaborative work? Mm. I, <laughs> I, I can say just off the bat, I think clarity of intention, there's like a very fine line between being completely open to uh -huh. things and wanting to allow completely unexpected, <clears throat> but also not being able to make your intentions clear. And I think if you haven't kind of mutually agreed on on some fundamentals, it can actually le lead you to quite a hairy place <laughs> where people can just be bewildered and felt kind of left out in the cold because they haven't been given clear enough instructions. And also, I, I think just to keep in mind that our aesthetics are always much more different than we think it is. You know, you just, lots of humans, I think we live in our heads and we kind of think, oh, everyone kind of thinks the same as me, except maybe Republicans and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, we're pretty much all the same you, we're sensible humans you know um but actually even amongst close friends there are those aesthetic differences which you only realize you're like really did you think that sounded good i i really like that <laughs> so yeah i can i can follow on from that and say i've been recently it's been an interesting season the past month or two where i've had a series of not very good collaborations that didn't work out well and in some cases were quite ended in a bit of a disaster, basically. Um, and so I, it's definitely a poignant question right now, William. <laughs> and I, I, what I will say is that I don't regret them happening in that they provoked a lot of like political and other imp and ideological and, and aesthetic questions. And they also made me just talking about personal things and vulnerabilities. They definitely made me think about what it is to work in it, like to revalue working with people you trust to disagree with and things not totally fall apart. Because that's that's actually, you know, when collaborations, you can be really open-minded and collaborations go well. But, and I've, I've had a long career of basically that until about two months ago. And then I had a series of things <laughs> where, yeah, I think it's just, it, it really can go wrong on so many levels, you know, when you are being vulnerable and, and everyone has, as Galina saying, like people have some pretty different ideas about what, what and that's what makes music so interesting people have really different ideas about what is good and what sounds good and what's nice and what isn't and what's valuable and you know what the point of it all is so i think that's that's the kind of richness of it but i think it really i think you know creating a scenario in a collaboration where if something goes wrong <laughs> there's an openness and there's a trust and there's a way of getting through things these are things that professional issues that i think musicians don't often talk about because you just pretty much are hoping hoping that it always goes right and it sometimes doesn't so it's a really good question indeed indeed cameron is now opened up with a, a slight follow-up um i don't know whether you'd want to respond Question, uh, the, the point about using multiple <clears throat> or a variety of systems so that no one system mm. kind of takes over sounds great. In the end, um, notation is also a tool in order for us to, yeah, to create what, to, to put there and to put into sound what we, what we think up, what we, um, our creative thoughts and that shouldn't be a, a hindrance rather a, a facilitator in, in in some way mm. i always think it's always additive isn't it it's like you yeah. know you never have to throw anything out it's just mm. all valuable and it's just we have more and more that we can add to the conversation and just also accept that we are, are drawn to different things some of us are drawn more to structure some of us more freedom and right. you know i think i spend so much time uh, putting myself in opposition to all the, the kind of strict things that I grew up with. I, I forget that actually they're very much part of who I am as, as a musician. I can't ever leave them behind completely. They're, they're amazing gifts. I think it's just to throw more gifts on the pile, I think. I think I think also that the, I have a notebook where I put everything to do with all my projects. And, uh -huh. and for me, that's really interesting 
paging through it every now and again and seeing what was useful depending on the nature of the collaboration or the work or how much time you have is there a script or are you literally writing like random notes on a page that makes sense in the in the moment and you'll never ever understand what you were writing again after that or drawings or squares or whatever it is depending on how much time you had or who, what the project was or what the instrument was that you're playing or you know all of that stuff it's i think i think as galina says like there's just having a big toolbox is fantastic and i think a lot of you know a lot of what's appropriate is to do with time the relationship you have with other musicians or the other people collab that you're collaborating with or you know all of that stuff it's a big can be a big mix and the more tools the better right right I have a feeling that we need, a, need another five bowed electrons to uh, to explore. Um, Cara and Galina, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Um, you've worked under pressure. You've you've delivered fantastic uh, product, fantastic works. I so so much uh, look forward to the concert this evening. Um, really, thank you very much, and I do hope we can um, we can speak again next year this time. Thank you, Theo. Thank you, Theo. Cool. Cool.